We are very excited to present our second keynote address. Um, we have Carrie Dolan, who is the CFO of Lending Club. We're really excited about Carrie for a number of reasons. One, as you'll hear more in her talk, she is personally very a trailblazing woman in a traditionally male-dominated industry. Second, the company she represents, Lending Club, is completely rethinking finance. So I, we thought it was just a perfect fit with the theme. Lastly, most important, she is a Haas grad twice over. She had got both her BS and her MBA from Haas. So we are especially proud to feature one of our own. <laughs> um, as CFO of Lending Club, Carrie is responsible for their financial management, accounting, financial planning and analysis, treasury, tax, fund, accounting, trading, all the in IR, big job. Prior to Lending Club, uh, Carrie was the treasurer for Charles Schwab, um, and she was also the CFO for Schwab Bank, which she helped launch in 2003. Prior to joining Schwab, Carrie held a variety of financial positions at Chevron in FP&A, management reporting, accounting, credit, um, and treasury. During her tenure, Carrie helped launch the Chevron Credit Bank, which offered proprietary credit cards and served on its board of directors as its CFO. Carrie was named the 2013 CFO of the Year for Emerging Companies by the San Francisco Business Times. Um, this award recognizes finance leaders who have made outstanding contribution to the company's performance as evidenced by significant growth and by recognition of the company as a leader in its industry. So please join me in welcoming Carrie Dolan. Uh, I sound very impressive in that bio. <laughs> Uh, so thank you for having me today. I am excited to be here. Um, as, as shared, actually, it's kind of fun to be back as a Haas grad, and, and actually, it's a little odd to be here versus there, right? Um, uh, I actually graduated in, I'm going to give you dates, you know, you're going to figure out my age, but um, I graduated in 87 as an undergrad, uh, and I was actually a business school undergrad, so it was Barrows Hall down the hill. Um, and I did accounting and finance. And then 10 years later in 97 was back for, for my MBA. Um, and actually kind of what's also a piece of trivia is my, my incoming class uh, in uh, graduate school was actually the part of the first class here at the business school. So uh, that was pretty exciting. Um, so I was thinking that um, kind of an honor of recognizing being a Haas grad and, and a double bear, which some of you may be. Actually, how many uh, in, the, in the audience are double bears? There, there are a few. So I actually wanted to, th I thought maybe I'd, I'd find a t-shirt that said double bear. Um, so I googled double bear. Um, that's what I got. Um, so I actually think the little orange guy is kind of creepy with the two heads. The, the bear up top maybe kind of works. So I um, actually kept looking and uh, couldn't find any Haas gear with a double bear. So I, I thought maybe I'd create my own. So here is uh, my, um, my t-shirt. Pretty good. Yeah, thank you. Um, so it actually kind of is me, right? It's simple, understated. I'm not you know, going to be very fancy here. Um, and so this got me thinking, okay, do I go create a t-shirt? Now, what, today you can actually literally create one t-shirt online with a design, although the copyright down here, trademark, might have gotten me in trouble, I don't know. But um, uh, so what would it take to actually start thinking about being, uh, you know, a, a startup t-shirt company, right? Um, and what does it take to be an entrepreneur? And also, what does it take to be in a startup? So all of these ideas I've been thinking about in, in um, coming to talk to you today. So, of course, I used Google again. We went and looked, I went and looked at uh, definition of an entrepreneur. So if we want to start a t-shirt company, what, what does this take? So dictionary.com here talks about, you know, initiative here and risk, starting an enterprise, I guess I'd ask each of you to think about, when, when you think about the word itself, what does it bring to mind? Does, it, you know, does this make sense for you, or do you kind of think about its 
you know, is, do you think it's Bill Gates? Do you think it's Steve Jobs? How do you define that term or that idea? And the one thing that I'd like you to think about with me as we kind of go through this today is just words and labels and kind of your own ideas about yourself. Because when I was graduating in, in 87, I had no idea that I would land eventually in a startup. And actually, I think I'm a little unique in that I was in a very big company, Chevron's really large, <laughs> to then Schwab, to then ultimately Lending Club, which when I joined uh, about four years ago was about 40 people. Um, and so there, I would have never done that 20 years ago at you know coming out of school. And so I think as you guys think about your own career path, and of course I have another pretty little slide here on paths. Um, when you think about your career path, what are you actually, what, what, what's helping you make decisions and how are you actually going through that? And so um, what I thought I'd spend maybe a little time on is just giving you some thoughts about what's been really helpful for me um, along that line. Um, you may be facing a decision around, do I go this direction or do I take this job? And what I'd encourage you all to think about is, is it's, it, it's not as big of a deal at the time as you're going to think it is. Because you can change your mind and you can make different decisions all the time. Um, and I'd also encourage you, it's okay to make mistakes and it's okay to iterate, which is also very much what you do in a startup. So... Um, couple things uh, here to go through. First, what's really important is to first just know yourself, your self-awareness. Um, when I was graduating in 87, this was, and I give you that date because this was probably January or February in 87, and I wanted to be an investment banker. This was, this was the time when Wall Street was very hot and the movie was out and all that. But... Um, way long ago, um, I was, um, it's where money was made, it was very hot, uh, I'm analytical, that was about all the criteria I needed, and I'm going to be an investment banker. And so um, I went back to New York for a week and interviewed with a number of firms, both large and small, and I'm in an interview with a small firm, boutique firm, and there's a managing director sitting behind a big desk, kind of very stereotypical, um, scowling at me a little bit. And um, we're 10 minutes into the interview, and he stops me and he says, you're really green, and you have no idea what you want to do. You know, and I'm, of course, I don't even remember how I handled that. You know, it was one of those points where you kind of just say, well, no, no, and you kind of try to argue. And the fact of the matter is, is he was absolutely right. I had no idea that, you know, 80, 100 hour weeks and people are put through kind of the churn of that. And, and also I'd never been anywhere outside of the Bay Area. And so even understanding New York and would that work, I had no idea. It just sounded good. And I just made some decisions around, okay, I should go do this. But that was really a very important kind of aspect for me to be you, you kind of hit in the face a little bit, but it was really helpful. Um, I had a, a similar situation when I, um, when I came to graduate school. Um, so with an undergrad of accounting and finance, I thought, well, I'll come back for an MBA. And several of my colleagues were, the, at the time that I met in school, they all were similar background. And they were going to, they, they decided, well, let's um, do a marketing emphasis. I don't know if you guys still do emphasis, but it felt like we had to pick. So, okay. And um, so, yeah, I'll do marketing emphasis. Well, I took a couple marketing classes in that first semester and just soon realized that I am not a marketer. Um, I, 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 um, I have a marketing colleague here, so I have to be careful. But uh, I'm just not a marketer. And, and, you know, knowing that about myself, it was, again, it was kind of a cool idea with others. This time I made the decision much quicker. I need to know myself, right? And so I'm the person in the room who sees risks. So I'm the person in the room that, um, so the, 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 the way that I, I tell this story is that um, my colleague, who is our chief operating officer, he's, he's essentially head of marketing, so um, our uh, CMO, he, uh, 
he, um, there is every single idea that comes out, he loves, right? He absolutely loves every idea. And he's like, he's the guy that's so enthusiastic and, and, and let's figure this out. And I'm the person in the room going, oh, really? You know, so I, that's me. You know, and I'm not going to be the excited for every person, you know, for every idea. But each of us come at things very differently. So he'll be really excited about that idea and then take it and start working it. And pretty soon he'll start to go, well, I'm not so sure. I'm the other way, right? Every idea is like, uh, uh, whoa, wait, what? And then slowly I start working in, it becomes a better idea. Knowing myself, knowing that about you, neither is right or wrong, neither is better. You, I may aspire to be like glass half full person, um, but I'm going to be, I'm just more serious, I'm more deliberative, I'm more kind of slow with that. So understanding my own personality is really, really important. I think as you kind of think about what role and what industry and what things fit for you. Kind of along that line, recognizing differences and don't label. What I mean by this is that, um, back to my colleague, um, he's very different, right? And, and I can t we can go back to even an entrepreneur. I'm not an entrepreneur. Well, each of you are probably thinking about what that means differently. So going further and saying, it, we don't stop at labels. Labels sometimes are helpful shorthand, but we can get really sucked into, you know, just saying, well, I'm, this is different because of X or Y. Um, I was at Schwab, and um, we, I was in a leadership team, about 10 of us, and I found that um, the way that decisions were made or the way that we went through things always felt very different. Well, I was the only woman out of the group of 10. And it was very easy early on to just say, it's because I'm a woman. That the other nine make decisions or think about things differently because um, I'm a woman. Well, Chevron actually, or sorry, Schwab um, brought in Gallup. And I don't know if, if you guys are familiar with um, strengths-based leadership that Gallup does. Absolutely love this stuff. So there's a book. Um, called Strengths Based Leadership. It's written by Tom Roth and Barry Conchi. And the, the concept is they Gallup spent years um, developing kind of statistical reviews of people and their strengths. And there's 34 different strengths. And so you take a test, and it essentially says, here's your top strengths, and they're in order, right? So the top kind of 10 or so really kind of define how you initially react to the world. It doesn't mean that strength number 30 you can't do. It just means your natural way of kind of going at it uh, is, is really in these top five. And so when I say I'm, I'm, I'm more deliberative, um, I'm a little more analytical, I'm, I'm more data driven, these are my top strengths. These are the way that I kind of naturally filter the world. So we did this in this, this team of 10. And um, we actually, Barry Conchi was the, was the facilitator, and he came in and, and uh, showed us a grid that showed our t the 10 colleagues in all these dimensions across the 34 different strains. And lo and behold, the nine other guys in the room were all similar in their strengths. I was very different in my strengths. And it was, a light bulb went on for me. It wasn't because I was a woman. It was because my strengths were different. And in fact, I said to Barry, I said, well, is this correlated between women have these strengths and men have these? Nope, not at all. It's completely statistical. There's no sort of correlation there. And so, you know, a place where I naturally went and said, oh, it's because I'm a woman. That's why this feels different. It's completely not the case. So... You know, really understanding differences um, and then be careful about the label, right? It is just so easy to kind of put yourself in a place where it's like we're different because of X or Y. Um, keep learning and learn how to make mistakes. So um, I love my experience at Chevron. When I, when I went in, um, kind of right out of school, not to New York Investment Banking, but to Chevron, very different. Um, 
Chevron actually um, tends to uh, bring people in at entry level and then moves them around. So I was there a number of years, but I moved about every two years. And for me, this worked for me. I, I, I felt like it kept me growing, it kept me learning. Um, and I am someone who just, for myself, I've got to be in an environment where I'm always learning, I'm always growing. But that doesn't mean I'm always getting promoted. Doesn't always mean that I am like succeeding because I really do think that um, mistakes teach you a lot and adversity teaches you a lot. I joined um, Lending Club four years ago, and um, so as I mentioned, it, it was 40 people, annual revenue of seven million. I, in my previous role, I was managing 40 people, <laughs> so it was just a really different process and. One of the things about a small company is that the way that you build is you are trying to figure stuff out, which by definition means you're learning and iterating and making mistakes. So I came from an environment where I never made mistakes. I, you know, I was all prepared. I had all figured out. You'd go and present an idea. Right? About two months into my time with Lending Club, I was pulling some data together for the CEO, presented it and then realized it was wrong, or he caught it was wrong. I can't exactly remember. You know, that's one of those moments where you panic. You know, you're brand new in the job, and you just screwed up. And uh, he was, like, totally okay with it. I mean, not just okay with it. It was kind of like, it was almost expected. It was almost like, we're going so fast. We are going to make mistakes. Move on. Just keep going. You know, you're not fired because it. Just move on. And so... The thing I often tell people about my experience, the, m the most unique thing I think about moving to Lending Club for me personally was it taught me how to make mistakes. That's the only way we're going to learn um, and continue to invent and grow. Um, we were talking about strengths here. I, um, there, there is lots of theories out there that you guys probably already know, but it, it, I find, you know, you, you, in your annual review, you're presented of, here's the things you did well, and here's the things that, you know, you need to work on. What do we all pay attention to? Those things that we want to work on, right? That's where we, okay, how do we fix it? I got, you know, five A's and one B. We're going to fret about the B, right? And so this is theory around you got to focus on your strengths. My, my example here is that, if I'm really good at baseball, which I am, um, and um, if I really suck at basketball, right, I don't go join a basketball team and try to work on the basketball skills, right? I join the baseball team and I work on batting and I work on fielding and I work on things that make me better at that because I love that. It's what gives me passion and energy. Focus on your strengths. And then what you do is you put people around you that are different from you. Um, so my colleague, back to my colleague who, who is enthusiastic and loves life and is just, you know, loves every idea, that's a great combination for me. And having people either that work with me as peers or people that I hire, you want to create an environment where people around you are helping strengthen what you aren't necessarily good at. And then... Stay flexible and open. Um, the, I mentioned um, already that when, when the opportunity first came uh, about Lending Club, um, I got a recruiter call, and he said, uh, Lending Club's needing a CFO. And I said, what's Lending Club? He says, social lending, peer-to-peer -peer lending. I had no idea what that was. And he said, yeah, it's a startup, <laughs> yeah, 40 people. And um, honestly, at that point, that was not what I wanted to do next. I had this, I was going to go to a mid-sized company and be a CFO, um, and, and not a divisional CFO. I'd very much in my head, here was my next move. And it was, I wanted financial services. Um, I love my experience at Schwab and wanted to kind of take that to something else. And, and yet, I was open. And um, that's, that's what's, I think, really some of the themes here is that if I knew, I knew enough about myself, I'd learned from the, the um, recruiter that 
the, the idea of it was kind of banking and brokerage and credit card and structured finance and all these things that actually I had done in my career mixed together differently. And I thought, well, that's kind of intriguing. You know, startups tend to be, uh, the CFO tends to worry about cash and payables. And that job didn't seem big enough, but yet all this other stuff around using my background and being able to help drive the company and build the company and be part of it, more from just than the finance geek, you know? It's like a business person. I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting. And then I'm, so, okay, I'll meet the CEO. Absolutely loved him. He, you know, he and I connected. The chemistry was good. And also I'd learn enough about myself that I really want to like, like who I'm working with, right? Because you're there like more than with your family. And so uh, you really have to know and love that environment. And so um, I took a chance, which most people thought four years ago was crazy. Uh, because if you looked at my career path, I went to a little no-name company. Um, but being the risk person, I'll tell you my, my thought process here, which was the worst case scenario was Lending Club at the time had about two years worth of money. So they'd raise money, they were burning, they were losing money every month, and they, if they kind of stayed on the same pace of loss, I had two years. So that was my downside, which is I could go in, try it for two years, and then look for another job. Oh well, make a mistake, figure it out, move on. And the upside could be really fun um, and has been pretty incredible. So really, point of all of this for you guys that, I, that would be my best guidance around kind of how I navigated my career and what I still do today. None of this is like, I've, none of, you don't ever solve anything. <laughs> Keep trying. Is, is um, if you know yourself, I think it really helps confidence. And I, and I know all, every one of us, you know, thinks about, um, am I good enough? Can I do this? Should I try? You know, all the self-doubt stuff. I think the better you are at just understanding and knowing yourself, the more confident you are. And then I also think then when you do that, you're going to make a better decision around that next job or that next role. It will fit because when you love what you do and it's energetic, you're going to do your best work. So let me, uh, let me take a minute and talk about what is Lending Club. Um, so let's talk first about um, kind of the model. So banking. In banking, we collect deposits, right? A bank collects deposit and turns around and makes loans to the other side. That's the basics of the model. In that, um, the bank takes risks. So if, if, the, if the borrower defaults or if there is kind of interest rate risk mismatch for it's a three-year loan versus overnight deposits, there's risk that bank has, which is essentially why banks carry capital. The other part of what a bank does is they underwrite and service. So in Lending Club here, what we do is pretty simply that middleman operation of a bank, we're outsourcing the capital side. So the investor, instead of it's a deposit, they're investing directly in that loan. It's a match security, um, and they bear the risk of the loss. And then on the operation side, what Lending Club's doing is using technology. So think about when Amazon came along and essentially started to displace retailers. They did it all online, all with technology. That's what we're doing on the operation side of the bank. So kind of how it works is um, you essentially have a borrower looking for $10,000. You will have hundreds of investors fund that one loan. So people put 25 or 50 or $100 kind of in an individual loan. And then on the investor side, you're building your own portfolio. So you're creating your own diversity kind of around your portfolio. We don't, we're, not, we're not creating pools or structured securitization finance and that sort of thing that, that kind of historically been out there. You individually are investing directly in that loan. So what this looks like is what we do is we grade loans. So we do the underwriting. People apply online, goes through our algorithm. We then assign a grade. So here this shows you the least risky would be an A grade. The most risky kind of moves up the scale. And the rates are set towards that. 
And then what happens is this second part is what you would do as an investor. So any one of you open up a brokerage account with us and then you create your portfolio of loans. And this shows here at the bottom. I know it's maybe hard to read in the back, but somebody with $10,000 has 180 different positions or loans across the grades. And these are the high-level grades. There's seven of them. There's actually 35 different levels of, of, of risk kind of within that. And then this shows you you would earn an average coupon of a little under uh, 15%. Your losses annually would be over four. So again, the investor bears the loss. There will be losses, but that coupon and the diversity essentially gives you very good loss coverage. And then the servicing charge that we take from the investor and projected returns here. So pretty simple model. It's banking, just direct. There's no structuring. There's no kind of hidden things around this. So what makes us different is the cost. So in, um, again, when you think about case studies where you've had traditional industries like music get disrupted with online um, competitors, there's been nobody in really financial services that have come and disrupt banks. There's a lot of innovation around payments, but not so much on the lending side. So Lending Club does not have branch requirements. We don't have the reserve requirements. And then of the things that we do similar to a bank, we actually are doing it at a much lower cost because it's all online. We've built the technology to be online, to acquire uh, the borrower, and do all the servicing and underwriting in an automated way. My favorite chart, the financials. I like data. Um, so, the bars show you our originations. In the fourth quarter of 2013, we originated just under 700 million in origination in, in loans. Um, during 2013, we originated a little over two billion in loans. And the the growth rate is pretty staggering. The revenue here uh, in 2012, we earned 34 million of revenue. We were just under 100 million last year. Huge growth, and as I mentioned, when I when I joined four years ago, the, the annual revenue, or maybe I didn't, but the annual revenue was about seven million. So it's been pretty incredible growth, um, which is fun and challenging, right? This is where the risk side of me is. Uh, let's make sure it's good, disciplined growth in terms of the process, right? So fast growth is great, but also doing it in a responsible way is really important. So. Couple things just on positioning. Um, I think that's kind of unique about us right now. Um, we are well positioned from, we've got fast growth. We essentially have very limited competition. Um, it's gonna be very hard for banks to compete with us because that lower operating cost structure allows us to lower rates to borrowers. So structurally, a bank coming in and actually competing is gonna be very tough. On the flip side, new entrants, somebody, you know, you guys, you creative guys here that are all entrepreneurs, um, are going to start an, a, a competitor. It's very hard, the regulatory structure and the credit underwriting and then the history, right? When you buy a mutual fund, you want to look at that mutual fund's track record, right? Is it three or five years? And with the same concept. We've got to create a track record, and we've been at it seven years, and so we've got enough momentum here where I think folks are feeling really good about it. Um, and that is then accelerating that. And so that's this last point, which is you may have heard of network effects, feedback loop. So LinkedIn, Facebook, they're getting bigger and growing because the bigger platform is more attractive, right? You know everybody's on LinkedIn, so you go get on LinkedIn. You're not going to go to some other site. So the effect of kind of having a dominant player with more inventory, more pricing power. That's, a, 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 that's what's happening with, with us at this point. And so well positioned. So what, what I would, would kind of leave you in coming back to thinking a bit about um, how this works for me. I love the business model. I can talk about that all day long. Um, and it fits with my background. But it's not just about the business itself. It's also very much about um, 
how does it work for me and my personality and my strengths and how do I feel like I, you know, I'm, I'm having fun every day. So a couple of things just about our values. I mean, we are very much, um, and this starts with our CEO, being forward-looking, action-oriented. We're trying to build something that is long-term. Um, and considering kind of how every day the decisions that we're making kind of think about that long-term, really important to the core here. The second is testing and learning. So this is back to the idea that, that if we're creating, if we're really disrupting an industry and creating an industry and doing kind of different things, then we've got to constantly test and learn. I mean, what's I think really interesting is, is our founder, Renaud LaPlanche, he had absolutely no financial services experience when he started the company seven years ago. And I actually think that's some of the reasons why we've been successful, because in a regulated industry like financial services, there's rules, and you just some of you, when you when you're in your box, you think, ah, oh, I can't do that, right? He didn't have those constraints, and so even thinking about that for yourself, if you get stuck with rules and stuck with labels, sometimes that limits you. And I, I really think to be creative, you got to think broadly. And then finally, the team. Um, we're very much about the team, so we often say. You're great, but it's not about you, right? We want everybody to be superstars in the company. But if you walk in and you're there to just prove yourself and kind of advance yourself, that won't work with us. We're much more about you're, you're here to build a company and you're, you're, we're, we're together trying to do this. And we all have to have our differences and our strengths to actually do that. So really kind of... Uh, Last thought here is um, really you got to find a place that allows you to do your best work. Now, of course, I can try to recruit all of you here, but um, the point is is that you knowing what you are good at and what fits with you, and that could be a big company, it could be a little company. Right now, I know startups and being in technology, and there we, we can find the investment banking correlations. Like when I came out, right of what's really hot right now. And you may be going into that, but hopefully you're doing that in a thoughtful manner, right? That you, the decisions that you make around that internship or where you land or kind of your next career choice, have you done enough homework? Have you done enough research? Do you know that it actually fits with your style and personality? And even as you interview, I think that's also really, really important as well. Um, so that's all I had in terms of, oh, and the boat. Oh, let me tell you about the boat. Um, so, what's really cool about this is that during the World Cup, there was, there's a transatlantic race from uh, LA to um, Hawaii, and um, our CEO was, is a, um, grew up in France and actually two-time champion, uh, French champion in small boats. Anyway, he actually was part of this transatlantic race. And um, they, we sponsored the, a boat, and he sailed on the boat, and we actually won. So it's pretty cool. So the boat actually was in the bay during the um, World Cup, and um, we, a lot of us got to sail on it, and we got up to really high speeds. Very cool. So <clears throat> I had to have that. Anyway, so I'm going to open it up to questions. All right, thank you, Carrie. If you guys do have questions, we have volunteers coming through the aisle, so please be sure to pass your questions across. Um, but we'll get started with some that we already have. So Carrie, what are the two to three main disadvantages associated with working for a large global company, and how have you overcome them? Disadvantage of large companies. So I think that, um, so my experience from Chevron was that as I moved around and moved up in the organization, sometimes the, the hard part about a large company is that you are seeing a very small area, right? You don't get, a lot of us would like to see kind of more broad of what's going on. So if I went into, I started my, um, um, my first assignment was in gas accounting, natural gas accounting, which is a very complex thing. Gas, Gas is this 
you know, they take it out of the ground and it has to be pressurized and you have to allocate it to all the land. And it was kind of an interesting process, but there were probably 150 people in that organization doing that work just across all the different geographies. And so I got very good at something very specific, but it was hard to see um, broad things. Now, um, I'd say, again, the one thing I loved about Chevron is I often say it's kind of GE-like. It taught me how to do processes really, really well. I understood discipline around the right reporting, great data and infrastructures. A lot of that stuff was built out, right? Where you come into a startup, there is no data warehouse. Like, how do you get data? And so, you know, there is, there is differences around that. For me, the, the higher I went in that organization, the, the less um, diversity there was in terms of just thinking. A lot of people had been in the, Chevron's culture is you're there for a long time and the longer you go. And that was really, for me, what started to cause me to think, okay, I want something more. I want to be in a place where I feel like I have more interaction. So that's what led that difference for me. All right, so we have another audience question. Um, you were talking about self-awareness and how important that is. Um, we're wondering if there's a peak age for self-awareness and how many years did it take you to feel self-aware? Did you ever get to a point where you looked back and thought, wow. <laughs> There's an age joke here somewhere, but, uh, you know, um, what's interesting was, um, I, I think there's a real difference, though, um, when I was in school versus when now, right, which is, which is school focused on um, technical skills, right? I, there were projects, so I, I did have to work in groups, right? You're thrown together with your project group, and you hate that work because you can't do it yourself, right? And you got to work with people that you may or may not like, right? Um, and you have different personalities and all that. But <laughs> that's actually the most important work. I mean, you can learn the technical side of how to do discounted cash flows or how to do a marketing plan or that sort of thing. But um, I think understanding a bit about how, if you're stressed in that group situation, Figuring out why and trying to understand why is really important. And so uh, what, I, what I was talking to uh, some folks earlier about is I think there's actually a whole lot more tools out for folks today to do self-assessments, right? So Myers-Briggs was the one way long ago of TFIJN, whatever it is. I still don't know what those mean. But, but um, so I think you can start, self-awareness should start really, really early. And it will change over time because as you are learning, you're going into a new experience and you, you have to kind of reassess, Am I work, does this work for me? The other thing is don't be shy about asking for feedback. Don't be shy. When you get criticized, that is like really important data for you, right? You got to have tough skin and you got to take that in because even if it's wrong, Somebody has a perception, right? Somebody gave you that, right? And so how you're perceived, I may think, so something about me is that um, I mentioned that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm more deliberate. Um, I'm, I'm also, I am shy. I know that's probably, you don't think that, but I am, I'm more reserved. Um, things like this take a lot of energy for me. I'll go home and nap, you know? I just, <laughs> that's not because of age. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, um, but there are, but when I'm like this day to day, and I'm serious, people in the organization that don't know me well will think I'm scary and intimidating and serious and, right? Which, that's their perception of me. And me understanding that, I try to change. <laughs> I try not to be so scary or serious, but I, you know, that's back to, do I work on that as a development need? Do I need to spend time? No, but I also need to understand that there's a chance that, that people are going to perceive me that way. So I don't know. I, I, I think there's so many tools out there and so much. It's a lifelong work around self-awareness. If you aren't paying attention to that or you don't think about that in, in everything you do, I think you're missing out. 
Uh, we had a lot of questions about Lending Club and about risk. So you talk a lot about your own personal risk focus. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what happens in a down cycle at Lending Club and also maybe how Lending Club differs from a traditional lending organization when it looks at borrower risk. Yep, yep. So we started the company. So, so let, we're, we're going to talk here a little bit about um, underwriting and the loan side. We started underwriting loans, and um, we weren't, we're essentially doing it the way that a bank does. So it's not so much special sauce around our underwriting. Um, what's a little different for us is that we are doing it with online data. So the, just think about the trends with big data. The more and more data there is about people besides a FICO or score or credit report, the more we're going to use that and pull that in. So we are set up to continue to do that. We started in 2008, and our losses from that year were terrible. That was also the first year we were, we were doing it, and it was also during the financial crisis into 08, 09, where um, job losses were skyrocketing, and there's a correlation with that. So um, our um, brand is the underwriting. And so our ability to continue to iterate and adjust and understand each and every channel. So we get somebody from search. You Google lending. You come in through Google. We don't necessarily, you're a higher credit risk than if you came in through mint.com where you're actually already out there trying to do something to make yourself financially more responsible if you were equal on all of those aspects. So we're using all of that data to try to go through and understand you know, your risk versus your risk. And what we do differently than banks is banks tend to underwrite you all as a pool. You'll get a credit card offer and it'll all be 10% or it'll all be 15%, right? Some of you really should be at 20. <laughs> and then some of you may be at eight based on your risk differences, right? So, but in our, in our model, we're individually underwriting everyone to try to get that risk specifically. So we've done lots of stress testing and over the years continue to evolve our... Um, underwriting, and um, we'll continue to do that. When, when the economy, right now, credit and credit cards um, continue to improve, the job and the economy is continuing to improve, you're seeing loss rates come down. Um, but, at, but, we have to, but it's cycles, and lending are cycles. And we started in a really bad cycle, and we'll, it, we'll see it come back again. And that's where a lot of what we're trying to do is deliver consistent returns. So at the time, I showed you that shopping cart. When you go into the cart and you pick your loans, we'll show you a net projected return, and that's based on today. We think based on the way the economy is going and our history and all of that taken into account, we'll say an A grade has a net return of six. And in this case, we're trying to deliver six. Not seven, not five. We're trying to actually underwrite so that we're consistent with those returns. And so that's kind of the way that we think about um, offering this. We, those, that 6% A grade might be four or three in a bad economy. It, in fact, in 08, 09, kind of the average return across our platform was kind of in the four to 5% range. That was still better than the S&P and other fixed income. You could get you know, two basis points on your money fund I mean, so on a relative basis, that's the way we think about it, because on the investor side, it's a relative return relative to other investments. Thanks, Gary. So we're going to switch gears a little bit. Um, I think there are a lot of people in the audience who have switched careers in the past or are possibly thinking about it. So what were the indicators for you that it was time to leave a position or organization and move on to a new opportunity? So um, that... that comes slowly for me. Again, this is a little bit about my process, which is, you know, there are times where I probably stayed a little too long or something became a little too stressful. And sometimes even when you're in it, it's hard to know. Um, I think back to if you're paying attention to, do you love what you do? Are you excited about what you do? I mean, in your, you know, you've, we've all been in that situation where we kind of like have worked for 10 hours and don't realize that it's five o'clock already. And it was like, and, and you're still like got a lot of energy and you want to keep going, um, that's a good sign. <laughs> um, if the flip side's happening, then take note of that. Um, the, the other thing is um, 
I almost want to say kids these days. Oh. Um, I have noticed that when I was younger and, and first out, that um, uh, career management is a joint responsibility. And I still believe this today. I don't know that I was always consistent. But what that means is that I am responsible and my manager is responsible. Now, what that also means, uh, there, there's a lot of times where um, an employee will come in and say, okay, I'm leaving. And, and, and the manager's like, what? I thought you were happy. And the problem with that is they're not, there's no conversation, right? And so each of you need to obviously take responsibility for your own career, but you need to be pushing on your manager or supervisor as well, right? Their responsibility is around development. And they should be having conversations with you, not just how to do your job better, but what is it that you want to do next, right? And so sometimes it may not be leaving the organization. Sometimes it may be I'm trying to get to the next role or the next job in that organization. How am I doing that? Um, but I think it comes back to, you know, are you, are you energized? Are you learning? And the flip side of this, too, though, is there are times where... Um, in life, there's things outside of life that you have to navigate to, right? It's not always, am I growing, am I changing? Sometimes having a job where it's a little less stressful and I can manage my outside life a little differently is also okay, too. And so I think it, it's really around kind of how you're feeling, but it's, it's got to be proactive. Um, and you, you've got to just have a sense of, am I, you know, what is my checklist around what makes me energize, what passion do I have? And if I'm not getting it from my job, do something about it, right? It may not be leave, but begin to kind of explore it. Great, thank you. Um, so what is Lending Club's ultimate goal? Is it around social impact? Is it financial impact? Are you just trying to disrupt the industry? And if the goal is social impact, how are you measuring it? Yeah, we're, we're out to rule the world here. <laughs> uh, we are building a company that will fundamentally change financial services. There's no question. That's, that's what we're in here to do. Um, we are, when I say we're here to disrupt banks, we've got to be careful because banks are actually part of this, right? There is, like Amazon, right? You can go out today and actually have, or eBay is probably a better example, right? eBay used to be just individuals back and forth, but now you have actual sellers that have made a business on that, right? We fundamentally think that um, technology... Um, can change the way banking is done. And that, you know, 100 years ago when banks were invented or longer and there was no technology, you had to have an intermediary that brought two sides together and kind of redistributed wealth. But in our case, doing it with technology, we, we feel like we, we have one product today, which is an, un, um, an unsecured consumer loan that's essentially three or five years amortizing. So if you have a credit card debt, a lot of people are rolling it over to refinance into this type of product. We announced late last year that we're doing a small business product. There's, that's also an area where there's a lot of dislocation. And so that's product number two. But you keep going. Every product that a bank has, mortgages, credit cards, um, student loans, autos, there's no reason why this model couldn't be applied to that, all right? And, and, and the flip side of it that I love is that you, if you're investors, prior to Lending Club, you had no way of investing in this type of asset class, right? Banks originated consumer credit through, like, credit cards, held it on their balance sheet. It's great stuff. They earned tons of money on it. They never, there was some that gets securitized, so maybe you could buy into a mutual fund to get a little sliver of it. But this is a case where you actually get direct access to this type of asset class. And I actually think that's pretty cool from the investor side as well. It's not just around kind of disrupting banking, but it's also expanding for investors and the investor community uh, into a different asset class. Um, so we're here to rule the world. It's pretty simple. That sounds good. Um, this will be our last question, but you talked a little bit about the Gallup and the Strength Finder. Is that something that you've implemented at Lending Club? Yeah, we have. We, um, we're rolling it out um, uh, kind of slowly. So a couple of things uh, about this. I, it was something I loved with, uh, with what we did at Schwab. So um, 
we had um, Barry Conchi bring it to our leadership team. So we've right now had the exec team take it, um, and we have uh, plans for rolling it out broadly to the, to the organization. The other thing that we're doing is um, r relative to Gallup is employee surveys. So there's um, 12 questions that Gallup has, again, developed over time with data. And, and, and you know, employee surveys and some of the softer stuff, I really like data. So I'm, you're going to hear my natural kind of tendency for these types of things. But statistically, they have found kind of a hierarchy of needs for employee satisfaction. And so basic questions start out like, do you have the tools and resources to do your job daily? And then it kind of builds to, you know, are you doing your best work? Do you feel like you are? Is there someone encouraging your development? Those types of things. And so we've rolled that out to all employees. We've done that survey now, I think, twice and maybe three times. And so um, that is something that we're going to continue to build on to. We, we want to build a great company, which absolutely means having a great business model, but also having great employees. Because at the end of the day, if you've got folks that are really creative, really innovative, love what they do, that's really what drives you. It can't just be you know, a great founder or a great person here and there. It's got to be a whole team effect. Um, so we will definitely continue to, to uh, extend the Gallup suite of things, but certainly strengths-based leadership as well. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Carrie. Yeah. Okay. Uh,